willnisley.com Will Nisley. It's our penultimate program of 2016. I'm Carl Azus for CNN Student News. Thank you for taking time for us. First up this Thursday, the nation of Turkey. It's often characterized as a bridge between East and West, or Asia and Europe. It's home to more than 80 million people, and Turkey is a nation on edge. Since July, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has been ruling during a state of emergency. That was declared after an attempted coup failed to overthrow the Turkish leader. Now, the country's lawmakers are debating a controversial bill that could dramatically change Turkey's government. It would increase the president's power and take some away from the nation's parliament. Supporters say this would bring Mr. Erdogan and Turkey itself more stability. And critics say it would move the country closer to authoritarian rule and make it less secure. The bill has a few hurdles to clear before it would become law, if it becomes law. In the meantime, it's one of many challenges the country is facing from both within and outside its borders. Another attack in a bloody year for Turkey, a complex situation where the president survived a failed military coup attempt in July. Here are the basics. The first thing is that Turkey shares a 500 mile border with Syria, not exactly the most secure border in the world. ISIS is fighting right next door, and in 2014, they attacked inside Turkey for the first time. Ironically, it came after accusations that Turkey's open border policy with Syria had been allowing fighters free passage into Syria to help topple the Syrian government, which also gave ISIS fighters access to Syria. Now those very same groups are turning their weapons to the north, with the biggest attack believed to have been carried out by ISIS taking place at Istanbul's international airport earlier this year. Then there's the Kurdish separatists. The Kurds are an ethnic group. They straddle Syria, Iran, Iraq, and parts of Turkey. Some Kurdish militias backed by the United States are fighting against ISIS in Syria, but Turkey considers them terrorists and has carried out some airstrikes against them. Some Kurdish militia attacks have been in retaliation for them. The attacks near a football stadium, which killed mostly police officers, were carried out by a group called the Kurdish Freedom Hawks. They're a splinter group of the PKK. That's the Kurdistan Workers' Party, a group that's officially outlawed in Turkey. The splinter group has attacked inside Turkey dozens of times. Many of their targets are security related, places like police stations or military barracks, but they've also attacked marketplaces and tourist spots. They say they're fighting to defend Kurdish rights. The US Federal Reserve has just raised its key interest rate by a quarter of a percentage point. Let's explain that. The Fed is the central bank of the United States and it can influence the US economy. It wants that economy to grow but not so fast that inflation gets out of control. That's when the prices of things go up and the dollar buys less. Americans' wages have not increased much in recent years, but analysts say there are other signs the economy is improving. The U.S. unemployment, or jobless rate, was at 4.6% last month. That's about where it was before the Great Recession hit in 2007. The government says 180,000 jobs have been created each month this year on average, though that's less than the two previous years. The gross domestic product increased in the third quarter of the year, and inflation rose 1.6% in October. One way the Fed can try to slow down the rise of inflation is by increasing its key interest rate, which it just did. But that affects consumers because it makes it more expensive for them to borrow money. Mortgage rates on homes will go up. Car loans will be more expensive. Credit card rates increase. On the flip side, savings accounts could start to pay a little more interest, so those are things to look out for in the months ahead. All right, next story. At an amber market in the Asian country of Myanmar, which is also known as Burma, a Chinese paleontologist recently found something amazing. The tail of what scientists say is a 99 million year old dinosaur. It was frozen in amber, yes, like Jurassic Park. The paleontologist said the seller might not have realized the importance of the find, but he didn't raise the price. Researchers believe it was the tail of a sparrow-sized dinosaur from a group called cellurosaurs. And close-ups of the tail indicate the animal had feathers instead of scales, 
One expert says these aren't quite the Godzilla-style scaly monsters we once thought they were. Another paleontologist co-published the findings on the specimen in a scientific journal named Current Biology. He says it's the first time that part of a mummified dinosaur skeleton has been found. He calls it a once-in-a-lifetime discovery with the finest details visible and in three dimensions. What you're about to see now is kind of the opposite of the mannequin challenge. It has to do with kinematics, the study of motion. A technologically advanced way to document the movements of people, animals, or objects is to use motion capture cameras. They're specialized. Higher-end mocap systems can cost tens of thousands of dollars. And while you might have seen them used for movies, sports, computer programs, or especially video games, this technology is also moving forward in the fields of engineering and medicine. Here's how. These are some of the latest motion capture cameras. Small, highly sensitive, and rigged up to catch even the slightest movement. Here in Oxford, I'm literally surrounded by cameras. The company is called Vicon, and it's been a pioneer in this field since the early 1980s. I think what we've created is a machine that is capable of measuring uh, human and animal movement in all its wonder, in, in all its beauty. It all begins with what looked like a series of small golf balls and the camera. If you look at the camera here, uh, you can see that it's got this strobe ring in front of it. And the strobe is putting out infrared light at a known frequency. If I get you to take that, okay. we'll move it here, just move it a little back. There we can see that the system here is, is picking up that and, and recognizing those, those circular markers. And what's happening is that the infrared light is, is coming out of the strobe. It's reflecting off the markers, bouncing back through the lens, and then we've got a filter inside the camera that's going to make sure that only this frequency of light passes through. This gives you one camera tracking movement, but for the system to work, you need multiple cameras and a defined space or volume as they call it. Rig up the cameras, then your subject, with all sensors attached, enters the volume and immediately their every move is being tracked. We visited a specialist centre at the Oxford University Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust. It's one of over 200 hospitals around the world Vicon has supplied their technology to. Here they specialise in helping those with cerebral palsy. There's no cure for cerebral palsy, unfortunately, and so it's all about improving their quality of life, making their movement easier um, for, for as long into their life as we can. It was time for my appointment. Sensors or markers placed on the skin and at the joints, I was asked to walk the length of their volume. My movement captured in every detail from every side by a battery of cameras. This produces an animation of my lower body as I walked and graphs showing how my joints are moving. This is ghostly. So what difference does it make to the patients? Well, it makes a huge difference because this allows us to really demystify the complexity of a movement pattern, pick out exactly the deviations which are important and allow us to pinpoint where the underlying problems are. And from that, we can use targeted treatment to help them with their mobility. Ending today's show courtside, in eastern Iowa, the Dubuque Courtside Cuties are members of the Granny Basketball League. It's an organization that has 24 teams across seven states. It's open to women who are over 50 years old. And while they're not paid, they do get to wear some awesome 1920s style uniforms, and they are allowed to raise money for charities. In this league, there's no running, jumping, or any physical contact, and dunking is not allowed. But any underhanded shots that go in are worth three points, so granny shots are a field goal. We'd say this is not your grandmother's basketball game, except it is. And while it might not net the slam dunk TV ratings of the NBA Finals, it is a great way for the matriarch to rule the court. CNN Student News has one more show. We hope to see you tomorrow. You can subscribe to my channel right here. You can visit my website right down here. And you can view a random video from, from my channel right over here.